Okay, I think we'll get started. Thank you to everybody who has taken the time to be part of this webinar. Uh, we have a relatively small group, not surprisingly, since this is probably the week that a lot of people are taking vacation. But I think you guys have a bit of a special opportunity because I think this will be a slightly different kind of webinar. Usually our webinars are very much us presenting the things that we've done that worked out well that we thought through and it uh, worked out exactly how we expected it to when we saved the environment and we did so and came in under budget etc cetera, etc cetera, like we always do except that's of course not <clears throat> always the case and this is an example of a project where some of the things we expected actually didn't play out the way that we expected them to and and we're sort of in the midst of revamping and and coming up with a different uh, slightly different direction to hit the same goal so I think it's going to be a slightly different kind of, of webinar but probably more interesting because of that um, I'm going to start off by saying a uh, welcome from um, myself, Guy Greenaway, at the Mustakis Institute. But this is a joint project that we've done with the Environmental Law Center, and Jason Unger, the executive director there, is the, the partner in this project. Jason's not on the, the webinar, but um, uh, I wanted to credit him with all of the work that he's done on, on the Community Conserve project as well. So just a couple of things here. First of all, the, the tech stuff. Everybody on the webinar, all of the attendees are muted by default. Please find your chat box because we're going to use the chat box for questions. And actually, there's going to be a component where I'm going to be asking you guys some specific things and getting feedback from you. You'll notice in the chat box that there's an op option to select to all panelists or to all panelists and attendees. Please choose the and attendees one so that everybody can see it. And now I'm just going to ask if a, a couple of people can in that chat box, send me a message to say if they can hear me okay, if the audio is okay. Okay, great. It's always a relief to find out that you just haven't been talking to yourself for the last five minutes. Okay, so what I'm going to do for this presentation on Community Conserve is give you some of the background, describe what the current structure is and how it's been operating for the last year and a half, and then tell you about the assessment that we've done, the developmental evaluation that we've done all the way through, and some of the things we're going to do for revision because of that. And the next steps from this will all play out in the fall. And so this is kind of a preview as to what's going to be happening in the fall. So starting with the background, why did we create Community Conserve? <laughs> And I'm even starting with that before I say what is community conserve, because the, the intention is the most important part, I think, here in understanding the program. When we were looking at it, we identified that municipalities from a, an environment and conservation perspective are facing a number of challenges, including that they're called on to address a number of environment and conservation dilemmas, either by mandate or just expectations on the part of different parties. Often those environmental issues and the solutions that people are looking for are defined by others, not by the municipalities. Finding the appropriate expertise to help can be difficult, especially if it's a slightly non-traditional kind of environmental need. Funding is always a barrier, trying to find the dollars to be able to answer those questions. And then in a lot of cases, municipalities would represent to us that they were facing similar issues to another municipality, but were unaware that that other municipality was facing that issue and doing something about that issue. So this was kind of the background to the whole Community Conserve idea. So Community Conserve was created to provide three things in response to that. First of all, a forum where municipal personnel have the ability to say what they think are the priority environmental issues for their municipality, for municipalities in general. A mechanism for municipalities to pool resources to be able to address those environmental issues that are shared environmental issues and put shared dollars towards that. And then in the end, a free repository of knowledge, information, the results of any of the work that was done to try and address some of these issues being freely available and easily accessible. So what is Community Conserve? I think in, in its most tangible form, its most um, basic description would be that it's a web platform. And that web platform allows for there to be an online forum to post and vote on, on issues and ideas that are of importance to municipalities, 
provides a streamlined tool for pooling those resources, and ultimately provides a, a repository of useful reports and, and tools and products. But I think in a, a less tangible way, Community Conserve is intended to be a municipal capacity building program. And I know that that phrase is quite overused. But what we wanted to do is create something that would give municipalities access to environment and conservation expertise, give that information based on a municipal viewpoint and not other viewpoints, again, put forward by people who were putting it forward from a, a very viable lens, but perhaps their own lens, and then provide facilitation for that, that collaboration and co-funding that municipalities had indicated might be beneficial to them in trying to address some of these issues. So who created Community Conserve? Like I mentioned before, the Mustakis Institute and the Environmental Law Centre. So between us, uh, we have about 60 years of experience and helping dozens of municipalities with different environmental and, and conservation challenges. But we again recognize that we are not municipalities and we work directly with the uh, rural municipalities of, of Alberta and Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. Um, I think most of you know these are the two largest municipal associations and what we had them do or the role the support role that they were playing is helping us by advising on the structure of the program, uh, vetting project plans, I'll describe what that means in just a second, and then communicating the results and the opportunities and awareness uh, to their members. So they're actively engaged in, in all of those aspects. And when we take these four organizations, and if you hear me mention the Community Conserve team, that's who I'm talking about. So we'd meet on a regular basis, representatives from the four organizations, talk through different structure elements and um, put together decisions on different aspects by consensus. We also recognize that even with that, it's still not municipalities. It's the environmental expertise, it's the associations and advocacy and communication expertise. So we also set up an advisory committee of people from a range of Alberta municipalities. So trying to get um, small, large, urban, rural, uh, people who were on council, who were um, senior staff people, um, a whole, like I said, a, a variety of, of perspectives. And it's not a committee that has a ton of work to do. It's just something that we wanted to have to be able to run stuff by and say, hey, it seems like this looks like a good idea. What do you guys think? Or here's the structure of what we're about to do. Can you give us some feedback from uh, a municipal perspective? So they very much an advisory committee to help us out. Okay, so what's the current structure? How, how is Community Conserve currently set up and has been set up for, like I said, the last 18 or so months? There's a variety of different pieces here. I'm just going to describe them very briefly, but then I'm going to go into them in, in a little more detail. So the structure is that um, environmental issues and ideas can be posted, they get voted on, plans are created from the top vote uh, vote getters and then there's an opportunity to co-fund those those project plans and all of the results at the end are put back onto the site so in a little more detail here what this means in the, the posting section is that municipal personnel so that means any staff member counselor manager whomever can post environmental issues or ideas from their municipality so they don't have to create a description of what they think needs to be done it's just a statement of hey it would be good to have a such and such or we're facing this kind of a uh, a frustration or a dilemma around environment and conservation. The postings are anonymous, only the community conserve team sees the names and the contact information, so you don't have to go through the process of representing your municipality or having it vetted through your municipality. We wanted a pretty free and open exchange of ideas from people. Then there's the voting opportunity. So all of those ideas that are put up, those issues that are put up onto the website, other municipal, municipal personnel can click on those and say, yeah, I see that in my municipality too, or yeah, that's on the horizon for us, or I think that's something that's important as well. So then participants in that voting are able to look through the whole range of ideas. It may not be something that they come up, came up with themselves or identified themselves, but they're going, oh yeah, that's something in my municipality as well. So you can vote for as many ideas as you want, as many issues as you want. And then a count of those votes would appear below each one of those posted ideas, each one of those um, issues. So you can see which ones are, are getting a lot of votes or getting fewer votes. Then the next step is the, the plans. And what happens here is the Community Conserve team would look at the ones that were getting the top votes and convert those into 
project plans. Now these are very simple outlines of an approach, a budget, a timeline. This is literally like one page just to say this is what we think could be done to try and address that issue or to try and follow up on, on that idea. Those project plans are posted back onto the website. So then the next step is the opportunity for municipalities to co-fund those plans. And municipalities, obviously there's no requirement here. If you're scanning through here and you see project plans that you think you want to be a part of funding, want to share the cost with other municipalities, then you can indicate so. Now, obviously this is different from the, the posting, the voting, only a person within a municipality who has that budget authority to to make a commitment on behalf of their municipality would be the ones participating here. And unlike other sort of crowdfunding or crowdsourcing mechanisms where you might be supporting something by clicking the button saying, hey, take $5 out of my uh, bank account or put it against my visa and drop that in right now, there's no direct funding through this. What we have is what we call the start the conversation button. It means no funds are actually transferred through the site. You start the process of engaging with a community conserved person to start talking about the possibility of your municipality being a participant in funding one of the projects. So then the last step is all of the results, all of the projects, all of the deliverables, the reports, the tools, all of that is put back onto the Community Conserve site. It's all free of charge. There's no requirement to register or get past a, a paywall, a registration wall, or remember a password, which is probably the biggest barrier to getting information. All of that is distributed through Creative Commons licenses, meaning that anybody can use that information. They can change it, modify it, do whatever they want with it. There's no cost to that and there's no limitations on that aside from you just have to credit where it came from and you can't commercialize it, turn around and, and sell it. We wanted that to be as freely available as possible. All of the financial transactions, and this is getting a little bit deep into the weeds, but I think it's an, an important piece, is facilitated through a standard grant agreement. So everybody is doing the exact same thing in terms of providing the, the funding to a, a co-funded project. And so that grant agreement designed by the Environmental Law Center would lay out the nature of the grant, the, the scope of the actual services that are being provided, the timing, which obviously is gonna be different for every project, and cancellation or termination. And um, again, not to go too far into the details, but the important point there is it answers a lot of the questions that come up like, well, what if all of the funding is not uh, it's not secured. Um, does this just go on forever or is there a timeline? Uh, all of those kinds of questions and, and obviously there's an opportunity to modify that a little bit for each one of the projects as they'll be slightly different in scope and size and scale. So for this whole project what we did was create a number of what we called catalyst projects at the beginning because we thought it was easier than just you know, waving hands and trying to describe it could be a thing that does a sort of such and such, but to say, okay, these are the sorts of projects, these are the sorts of things that would be appropriate to happen underneath the Community Conserve platform. So those projects, and they're all on the Community Conserve website right now, um, municipalities in Brownfield, understanding the, the opportunities and the, the liabilities associated with Brownfields. ELSA is the Alberta Land Stewardship Act, has a number of conservation tools there that are usable by municipalities, but may not be immediately obvious that they are or how. We had a series of webinars. Again, all of those are recorded and posted there. Municipal management of industrial development. How should a municipality approach that from an environmental perspective? Conservation easement is a tool that's mentioned in a lot of municipal development plans, but sometimes without clarity about exactly what that means. So conservation easement guide for how to create your own program, understand what that tool is. The municipal management of water bodies is a very challenging topic because of the jurisdiction of the provincial government. This is a document that lays out essentially the principles, the basics of that relationship. Municipalities environmental assessment. This one created a primer, what that means, what that looks like, and then a model bylaw that can be used, modified, or starting point for creating an environmental assessment bylaw. And then a general description of the scope of municipal powers and the environment, because that exists in lots of, of components of the Municipal Government Act, but other pieces of legislation. Just what does that mean? What does that look like? 
And then how municipalities apply environmental reserve. Um, <clears throat> the, there's information there about conservation reserves as well as that tool came out in the middle of that project being done, but just the ways that environmental reserve can be used for actual environmental conservation. So those are the catalyst projects. Those are the kinds of, of projects that we thought would be created using the community conserve platform. So our assessment. After a while of doing this, what was, what was it that we determined was working, was not working, what we should do? And we're very lucky that the, uh, the foundations that were funding this project gave us money to do a developmental evaluation as well, which just means the ability to, well, it's more complicated, but essentially it means the ability to do an assessment ongoing and be able to make some course corrections as we're going along. So a couple of things that we did in this assessment. First of all, just before we did the assessment, we had already identified that communications might be an issue. So we did a whole, what we called pulse communications, a year of really targeted communications, offered webinars and presentations to all of the municipal associations or associations that dealt with environment and conservation issues around um, municipalities or in the municipal context. And then we enhanced our communications in general, big social media push, um, created a regular community conserved newsletter, uh, more information through the municipal associations newsletters, and through our own organizational newsletters, and then even targeted emails and direct contact to people to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I think there's something there that you might be interested and you as a municipal person might want to take a look at. And then the other thing that we did was offer a matching grant. And what this opportunity created was the ability to, for five different projects, provide up to $10,000 in match. So if you had $10,000 to put forward, Community Conserve could put $10,000 forward. Or if you had 5,000, Community Conserve could put 5,000. Or if you had 20,000, Community Conserve could put 10,000. The call went out for uh, a period of time and um, <clears throat> the guidelines are actually the, the requirements were fairly simple. It's just tell us your idea and your issue, um, who your municipal, municipal partner is, and then how much you can contribute. So how much match you were looking for. And then the guidelines for that actual matching grant are the guidelines for community conserve. So it had to be an environment and conservation issue. It had to be something requiring what we call foundational information. So that means background research, tool development, guidebook, legal foundation, policy review, all of these things that are the information underlying a dilemma that you need to have in order to move forward on something. It all, anything had to be proposed by an Alberta municipality. And this was a key one. It had to be applicable to multiple Alberta municipalities. And what we mean by that was that this was a, a project idea or a piece of foundational information that would be usable by a number of different municipalities. So not just your own municipality, not a staff person for your municipality or a particular need for just your municipality, but something that you know would be applicable to others. Okay, so here's the, the crux of our assessment. What's been successful? The Catalyst projects, those completed projects that are on the site, very successful. Lots of downloads, lots of use. Tracking those has been, um, has been showing that there has been a great uptake in those and we've been getting lots of feedback and people mentioning that just even anecdotally in the different conversations that both organizations have with municipalities. Our partnership with the associations has been great. They've been very actively involved, uh, very active in helping us structure and review the, the program itself. Our advisory committee has been awesome. They have been uh, a really good group of people giving us uh, really kind of pithy insights into what we needed to know about a particular question, a particular approach. The general reception to the idea has been very, very strong right from the beginning. Uh, people are from people from municipalities are very supportive of this kind of idea. It seems to them to make sense, all of these different pieces. And it seems to be filling a niche that people are saying, yeah, that something that we need and it's something that we don't have, that would be good. But what has not been successful? <clears throat> So you may note, there's a lot of pretty significant items on here. So posting and voting, we've had very, very little uptake in the posting and the voting. So very few people posting ideas and issues, very few people voting on those. We've had no uptake on the fund pooling at all. There have been no municipalities who have stepped forward and said, hey, we wanna pool funds for this project or any other kind of project. The matching grant was a surprise to us. It was, um, 
a situation where we had very few applications and of those applications, none matched just even the basic requirements. And there were a couple that were still trying to figure out whether or not there's a way that it could be modified to match the, the minimum requirements and still be able to do something with that. And our Pulse outreach, we had uh, very little uptake on the offer for presentations and webinars, very little response to the communications push. Um, <clears throat> it didn't really create the pulse that we were talking about. It um, seemed to just continue on at uh, a very low level and a very low simmer. So why? And we did a, a bunch of research to try and understand wh why some of the things were unsuccessful. <laughs> we didn't research why some things were successful. We wanted to know why were the things that weren't working, in fact, not working. So <clears throat> what was affecting uptake? One of the key things that came back was that municipalities are quote, drinking from a fire hose. So during the whole process of this program, the Municipal Government Act was completely revamped. That meant that municipalities were really under the gun to try and understand all of these changes. There was a ton of consultation around all, all of these changes. They had a lot of work to try and participate just in understanding what was going on and providing feedback and working through workbooks. It was challenging. The new UCP government came in and introduced a completely different funding model that tossed a number of different municipal municipalities and municipal people into a bit of a, a tailspin trying to figure out how they adapt to that. And of course it constrained resources dramatically. And then also right in that period of time, oil and gas companies were defaulting on taxes that were owed to municipalities. And in some cases taking out huge portions of their annual budgets. It created obviously a crisis that needed to be focused on. Other things that were on the side of the, the desk were not gonna get much attention. Another component that came back repeatedly was, you don't know what you don't know. We've all heard that expression, but what we found was we were getting a good response when we would give something out, a catalyst project or an idea. Um, but we had a poor response when we'd say, hey, what, what do you think we should do? What should come forward here? Because that's a really challenging thing to, to answer sometimes. You can critique someone else's idea more easily than it is to come up with something just from, from scratch. And we also recognize that the, the offer of Community Conserve was somewhat esoteric. That's probably a good word because uh, a lot of people don't know what esoteric means. It, it, and that was the problem. What does this mean? What does foundational information mean? We would try and give examples, we would try and give descriptions, but it was clear that we weren't getting that message across about what was the kind of stuff that we thought Community Conserve could provide. We also heard back that there was what we perceived to be a fatigue with quote unquote, forced collaboration, meaning collaborations that were required of municipalities, not ones that they entered into voluntarily. So uh, metro region boards, especially the one that was implemented around the Calgary region, um, the new municipal government act required inter intermunicipal collaboration frameworks, everyone's scrambling to try and figure that out. The normal background process of amalgamations and annexations and intermunicipal development planning, the biodiversity management frameworks, which still is this thing in the background that people aren't quite aware of what that means from an environment and conservation perspective for municipalities. It was floating there, there was consultation around it, and just the, the regional plans in general. What's required there? Um, is this part of this? What do we have to do? So all of those kinds of come out and be part of, of something with other people kinds of requirements were, were it having the effect of creating some fatigue around collaboration that meant when you offered a, a voluntarily colla voluntary collaborative opportunity, not necessarily something that municipalities were interested in engaging in. And then also not looking to pool funds. Now, it's not that municipalities have not pooled funds or don't pool funds. Um, and it's not that they don't collaborate on providing services, like regional services commissions are a, a good example, um, regional servicing. But in general, to, to independently come forward and say, we're going to pool our funds for this thing, there's no real legislative backing for that. The mandate of a municipality is to focus on your own citizens, not outside of your, your borders. And so all of that creates a, 
a bit of a, a mindset swivel that has to happen when you're talking about pooling funds. So we didn't drop this in the midst of a situation where everyone was familiar with that kind of approach and, and automatically thinking about it. It was not something that was top of mind. So all of those things together, and there are a few other smaller things as well, we put into, we put into the pot and we said, okay, what, what are we going to do in terms of revising the Community Conserve program to try and actually make it work and work towards those goals that we had laid out right at the beginning? We don't want to stick with a, a mechanism. We don't want to stick with a program that is just a program for a program's sake. So we started a significant revision. So the changes that are coming uh, involve some things, but there are also some things that are going to stay the same. Some of the things are working. The website is still going to be the platform. There's still going to be the ability to collect that issues and ideas, that feedback from municipal, municipal personnel. There's still going to be the ability to pool funds, but rather than making it the focus of the Community Conserve program and site and all of that, it's going to move to a more secondary role. And all of the completed projects being available and available in the way that they are, that's going to stay the same. So what's going to change? We're going to move the emphasis of Community Conserve from being a fund pooling facilitation mechanism to being a resource, a place where municipalities can come and get the kind of information, that foundational information, and have access to it. So that means we're going to change the structure of the website a little bit. It's still going to, it's not a complete revamp, but it's going to look a little bit different. This is a significant one. It also means that the Mustakis Institute and the Environmental Law Center will be able to choose projects from the Ideas Forum and move forward with them. So if we see that coming up as an idea and we identify, oh, that's something I think I agree should be done. I think we can figure out where we could get funding to do that and we might pursue that independently or reach out specifically to certain municipalities to see if they want to be involved in it. So all of that happens in the background at the initiative of Mustakis and the Environmental Law Center, as opposed to waiting for municipalities to step forward and say, hey, I want to pool funds to do that. Like I said, there's still going to be that ability to, to pool funds if municipality is looking to do that, but we won't rely on that. And I mentioned Mustakis and ELC, but we're also going to be able to then open that up to involvement of other organizations. If there's another organization that looks at that same idea form, identifies something else and says, hey, yeah, that's something I think would be an initiative that our organization could take on that um, uh, matches with something that we're already doing, we think we can get funding, or maybe it's an agency like Municipal Affairs or Environment and Parks or whomever, but anyone else will be able to look at that and say, here's base information for us to understand what we should be doing to try and support municipalities' ability to deal with environment and conservation issues. So if you think about our existing website, and this is what it looks like when you come on, look at that bar across the top, the navigation bar. That, that sort of describes the way Community Conserve is structured and the way it operates right now. So <clears throat> right now we have the issues and ideas, fund a project, and completed projects. The way that's going to change is the issues and ideas is going to become an idea forum. So as opposed to being the thing that drives what gets uh, turned into a project plan and funded and done, it's going to be a place for sharing ideas and still voting on ideas. And then everybody has an opportunity to learn from that and use it in whatever way. Instead of funding a project, we're talking about pooling resources. So again, not an expectation that it will be funded through this, but an opportunity that you can pool resources. And so all of that background structure, standardized grant agreements, start a conversation, all of those kinds of things are still in place if you want to do that. And then the completed projects, what makes it sound like that's just things that were completed through Community Conserve, is now going to become a resource library, meaning it's all the foundational information projects that either the Mustakis Institute or Environmental Law Center have done, they're all going to be posted there. So um, rather than waiting for something to come out of com Community Conserve to serve its mandates, its goals, we're going to just put the stuff in there to begin with. And ongoing, anything that we create, either through a community can serve catalyst or through another mechanism, but still serves that purpose is going to be included on here. So then the navigation bar will look uh, like this and a little bit more simple resource library, idea forum, cool resources. 
So I mentioned this a little bit, but I think it's a key point that people ask about how projects are funded. So research capable NGOs like Mustacus and the Environmental Law Centre will go in there and we'll choose projects and we're going to go out and look for funding for those projects. Municipalities will still be able to pool funds for issues of, of common concern and that mechanism will still operate in the same way. Municipalities will still have access to it in the same way. We're hoping that then philanthropic funders, government agencies, whomever, other organizations will also be able to fund projects, whether it's projects that Mustakis and ELC are doing, projects that municipalities are looking for more pooled funds for, or projects of their own. But again, just a, an opportunity to hear the voice of municipalities on these issues and help have that help drive what actually gets done. So community conserved projects will still follow basic guidelines. It's not just any place where you saw the, the word environment and municipality gets thrown in there. Um, it's going to be those same kind of guidelines like I was describing before. First of all, it has to be an environment and conservation issue. Secondly, it has to be specific to Alberta municipalities. Now, it, it might be applicable beyond the borders, but the whole point here is to serve Alberta municipalities. So if it's information that uses a different legislative framework or different examples or different tools that exist outside of Alberta, it's not something we'll include here. It's still gonna be things that provide that foundational information background research, tool development information, guidebooks, legal foundation, policy review, any of that kind of foundational information to help municipalities better understand their issues, better understand the potential ideas, and apply that information more, more creatively to what they try and do. Um, and again, it's applicable to municipalities in general. So it may be driven by, uh, for example, the conservation easement guide. There was a single municipality who was interested in trying to figure out how to create a municipal conservation easement program for themselves. But what came out of that, or an additional project on top of that, was to create a guide for all municipalities. That in individual municipalities information is not what gets showcased there, it's the general guidance for all municipalities. So that's what we'll be looking for and that's what will go on to the Community Conserve site. So the next steps. Like I said, we're going to take the, the website and give it um, a cleaning. In fact, it's most of the way done. We're going to be launching that in the, in the fall and we'll do a big splash when we launch that. And we're also going to be working on, on project ideas that are current project ideas that have come forward. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, we already have is information from the existing ideas and issues that have been posted, the voting that's happened. So some of the, the ones that have had high, um, have been high vote getters. Aligning municipal plans with regional plans from an environmental perspective. What does that look like? What does that mean? What kind of guidance could there be there? New ways to use environmental reserves. We did that first document when things were just starting to change, but the Municipal Government Act actually changed quite significantly and municipalities are using it in different ways. So uh, using the environmental reserves tool in different ways. Um, <clears throat> municipal parks from a, a municipal perspective provide uh, a lot of opportunities obviously but there are some liability issues associated with that and it's sometimes hard to understand what that means so a plain language primer to help municipalities understand the liability components with parks red tape reduction is a big focus for this provincial government this current provincial government um, but there might be an opportunity for red tape reduction for environment and conservation efforts that municipalities are undertaking to help them remove or to help remove barriers so that they can move forward on those those initiatives the municipal role in wetland conservation actually I, I, I should take this one out of there because we've been there are a number of projects that have been working on this because it came up so high in the voting within community conserve there's been two or three projects Guidance for contaminated uh, sites management and development. So something more specific when you actually as a municipality want to try and, and um, <clears throat> redevelop and, and develop contaminated sites. What, what do you need to do? What do you need to know from a legal perspective? Regional approaches to parks. So lots of other areas have regional park systems. What would that look like in Alberta? What would we need to know or understand in terms of governance, in terms of resourcing, in terms of collaboration? And then <clears throat> I've, I've got some question marks here and I'm going to give you guys a moment because 
I want you to, to think about this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and pick your brains to, to try and get information from you guys about what you think should be on these, these sticky notes for the Mustakis Institute and the Environmental Law Center. But just before I do that, I want to mention again, some things that are not changing. The Community Conserve website, communityconserve.ca and info at communityconserve.ca. I want to say thank you to the Max Bell Foundation and an anonymous foundation for the support that they've given for this project and the, uh, the wild ride they've been through and supporting us as we've gone through all of our different twists and turns. I also want to mention that this webinar, uh, plus all of the webinars, the Mustakis Monday webinars, are available on our website at rockies.ca slash webinars.php, or you can go to the, the site, rockies.ca, it's under the resource library. But the slide decks and the recordings of the webinars are all available there. And then my contact information, I've crossed out my phone number temporarily because um, like everybody else, I'm not uh, at the office right now, but you can get me at the guy at rockies.ca email. Um, and now I feel like I should have crossed that out a little bit because I will be going on vacation. But if you email to that address, you'll also get some information about who you can talk to in the meantime while I'm gone. And I will, I will be back. Your email would be received and I would answer it as, as quickly as I could after returning. Um, but I'm, I'm going to back up here and, and just see, before we go into a lot of, um, well, maybe it might be combined, but um, I'm just wondering, as you guys are throwing out your questions, if you have some ideas that you think that we should pursue as, as community conserve type projects. And I'm just going to glance over here because there's one note here. Um, would you consider a brainstorming workshop with representatives from municipalities, professionals, industry, NGO citizens to come up with some project ideas for the site? Yeah, um, we've, we've done a number of brainstorming um, sessions and we've tried to do those with just municipalities and not because the, the other interests aren't vitally important, like municipalities are engaging with them on a, a constant basis. But one of the key roles of Community Conserve right back to the beginning was to try and, and have an opportunity for municipalities to voice what they think are the environment and conservation issues. Um, there's no question, I think that's from time. Yeah, there's no question time that um, having that cross-pollinization from, um, from different sectors and different perspectives could be really interesting too. So that's a, that's a good idea. Um, source water protection planning for municipal drinking water sources. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a great idea. I think there's going to be more and more need for that. I know that the Alberta Water Council and um, Alberta Environment and Parks have just released a, a source water or a, uh, a drinking water protection plan uh, tool guide. And I think you can get that from the Alberta uh, Water Council's website. Um, now, sorry, they, um, I think they just released not the guide, but the... Um, um, I can't remember what they call it, but it's essentially a terms of reference for creating a guide like that. Um, it could be valuable with Mustakas' expertise to help provide advice on engaging citizens in conservation efforts and good press for local actions that don't endanger the project success. High traffic in new parks, for example. That, that I'm going to tuck away into the <clears throat> Mustakas in general, um, not just uh, for, for municipalities idea. And um, I'm trying desperately to squeeze you guys for information for my empty sticky notes, but please put your, your own questions on here if you have them as well. Um, and while I say that, I also want to mention that this is the, uh, the last uh, Mustakis Monday webinar for the, for the season. We're going to stop for July and August. I think we're going to start again in September. This all started because of the the <clears throat> pandemic and the lockdown and everybody being at home in a way to try and, and connect people and get information out there and continue to serve our mandate. Um, and we're probably gonna send out a little bit of a survey to folks who have been participants just to find out whether they think that there would be value in continuing that in the fall. Um, but for now, we're, we're done. Um, it does uh, also riparian health assessments and any good ideas for improving riparian buffers. Okay, that's a good one, yeah. We'll add that one in too. And I can think of a number of partners who would be good to, to help in with that. Um, <clears throat> I, I should note again, my email was up there, guy at rockies.ca. 
uh, if you're like me, you tend to leave the meeting or sign off from the, the webinar and immediately your brain kicks back in and you have ideas afterwards. If that's the case, please just send me the, the email um, because I'm, I'm always very interested to know what people think would be good municipal environment and conservation ideas. Okay, I think the, the questions have wound down. Um, I want to, again, thank you all for participating. Like I said, it was a slightly smaller group. I hope that you enjoyed this webinar. We talked a little bit more through the, the things that we did wrong and how we tried to learn from them as opposed to just always presenting our, our success stories and how wonderfully perceptive we are and we never make mistakes. So um, <clears throat> I hope that uh, we'll be able to continue to engage with you guys in the, in the future. Um, just making sure. Oh yeah, Lisa Neem has um, has put a link in the the chat box to that document that I was just referring to. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna actually leave open the webinar just a little bit so people. Once I close the webinar, you lose the chat box, so people can see that link. I definitely suggest that you connect with that. Um, connecting municipalities by IDing environmentally sensitive areas. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> the Calgary Metro Region Board is facing that right now because their their regulation that enabled them requires them to come up with not I an identification of environmentally sensitive areas, but creating policies for uh, for environmentally sensitive areas that don't just replicate what municipalities are already doing. So I think that there yeah definitely could be some importance to that. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm wondering if not everybody is getting the links. I'm just going to send this out to everyone. Hopefully you can see that. This is what Lisa sent out. Um, can people just send to me if they didn't see that before, if that was not available to them? Or if it's available to them now? Um, I'm hoping that that's just got it now. Okay, that is good to know. That's something that we might be changing in the way we do our webinars in the future. Um, I'm just scanning through to just make sure there are not any other questions in here. Oh, as an offshoot of guidance for contaminated sites, management and development, possibilities of municipal involvement or support for future use of abandoned and reclaimed energy sites. Oh yeah, that's a good one, an increasingly important one. Um, tuck that one away too. Thank you, Cindy. And I probably shouldn't mumble when I'm saying that because now I realize you guys aren't reading that. Um, as an offshoot of guidance for contaminated sites and manage, contaminated sites management and development, possibilities of municipal involvement slash support for future use of abandoned slash reclaimed energy sites. Oh, someone just noted that there was a, um, that there was a failed link message when they tried to go to the site that you provided, Lisa. I wonder if that was just me cutting and pasting it incorrectly. I'm gonna try and do that again. Could someone else test that link just to make sure that it's available for everybody? And what I'll probably do is I'll um, add into the slide deck, not probably, I will add into the slide deck. Um, okay, great. It's, it's working now. Um, <clears throat> I won't do this. I was going to add into the slide deck that link so that um, people would have it for sure. Okay, well, thank you everybody again. If you have any questions, again, please don't hesitate to, to send out the, an email to me. And uh, I appreciate all of you taking part in this uh, last Mustakis Monday webinar. So take care and enjoy the rest of your week.